Hello and welcome to the Blue Open Studio tutorial video series. The topic of this video will be the grid object. In this video, we will be discussing the properties of the grid object and we will demonstrate configuring the grid object to display data. In Blue Open Studio, the grid object is one of the most powerful and versatile features in the software. This object not only allows you to view data, but to also modify and add data in the selected data source. This means that you can build a front end for a database that is user friendly and easy to use. The grid object allows you to read and write data in a tabular format to or from the data source configured in the grid object itself. These data sources can include a text file, a class tag, or a database. So now we will configure a grid object in our demo application. So the first thing that I'll do in the development under the Project Explorer pane, I will make sure I'm on the Graphics tab, and then I will open my template screen, and then go up to the Application menu and save this as a new screen called Grid. And then on the Grid screen, we will place one of our grid control objects. And to do that, we'll make sure that we're on the graphics menu of the ribbon. And under data objects, uh, click on grid. And then I will click and drag on the screen to place one of the grid objects. And then I will double click to bring up the properties. And in the object properties, we have several different uh, functions that we can configure here. The first is the data source. And under here, we have our three options, text file, class tag, and database. Depending on what we pick here, that will determine the settings that we have under the data source settings button. Uh, so the first one we're gonna configure will be for text file. So we'll leave that as it is. Once we open the data source settings, we see a dialog that is identical to the one we saw when we configured a dropdown or combo box in the active objects video. In here, we have to configure only a few parameters. The first is the file or the source of the data. So with this, we can do one of two things. We could either type in the path and the file name, or we could click on browse and point to the file. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna wanna do though, is we are going to want to create this text file. Uh, thankfully, uh, in the description of the video will be a link for a zip file called training files inside of there is a text file called grid.txt so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that file and I am going to place it into the root of my application directory so where the app file is will also be my grid text file. And if I open this to view, you see that we just have a few columns. First line is machine A, and then two values. Second line is blank, third line machine B, two values, and so on. And you see that each value here is separated by a comma, and that's going to be important. So once I have that there, I'll come back into my development and I can browse to the root and then find the grid.txt and open it. And you see that in the path, it didn't give the full path. It just says grid.txt. That's because similar to how the get at path function, as you see down here, gives me the root of the application folder or where the app file is located. That is the starting directory for the application. So if you are storing any files in any subdirectories or subfolders inside of that main application folder, you can omit that whole path. And for my example, C colon slash BOS underscore training. I can omit all that and just simply put in from there. If it's in a different directory outside of your application, say it's stored on a different drive, then the full path is required. 
And then below that we have our delimiters where we can select multiple if we want. So we can use multiple delimiters, not just limit ourselves to one. In this case, we only want to leave it as comma because that's how the text file is set up. And then finally down at the bottom is a checkbox for the read only option. What this does is it locks out changes to the source file. So what we can do is if we have that checked, the grid object will allow us to read values from the text file in, but it will prevent any changes being made to the text file, regardless of how we have the grid object configured, whether we configure to allow values to be written or updated, this will prevent that no matter how we have it configured. So I'm going to leave that unchecked. And now with my file configured, I will click OK. And as I mentioned, this data source settings will change based on our data source selection here. We will be covering in this video the class tag configuration as well. However, for database, that will be covered in the database connectivity tutorial video. Then I will go to columns and we see that we have a layout of different fields. These are the columns that we want to display. Now with a text file, the labels pretty much are user defined. They do not tie to a particular column or set of data in the source text file. However, what we will be setting up here is if you see we have column numbers. So if I bring up my text file again, and I snap this to the right, we see that we have essentially three columns. Uh, and how this is laid out is for the labels, we will say that the first column is machine name, or just machine. Second column will be uptime. Third column will be downtime. So I will close my grid text file again, come back here in my development, change the label to machine. For the second row in the configuration, which will be the second column during runtime, I'll put in up time, and then we'll add a third and make that down time. And then for the types, we have several different selections available, text, numeric, picture, or checkbox. So text and numeric are fairly straightforward. For picture, it will allow us to actually show an image. The problem with that is that it does not shrink the image down very well. It doesn't help resizing. So you're either dealing with rows that are extremely tall or a column that's extremely wide or pictures that may be too small to see clearly. And then checkbox is a simple true false. It will be a checkbox field and the check will mean it's true. If it's unchecked or cleared, it'll be false. So for machine, we'll leave it as text. And then for uptime and downtime, we'll set both of them to numeric. And then we see a width. This is the starting width of the columns. Now we can modify this with that runtime. We can make the column larger or smaller. This is just the width that it will start out. And I'll leave them all set to default. Same with the alignment. Uh, we have three options, left, center, and right. And I will leave them all at default. And then we have a column for input. This is different than the read-only option for the source. What this does is this allows us for that specific column to allow input or not on that column or to allow us to modify the value that's in that column. The read-only option for the data source settings supersedes this. Regardless of how I have this set, if I have the read-only option enabled in the data source settings, these will be ignored. In this case though, I have the read-only unchecked and I will leave these set to check because we want to actually test being able to modify the values. And then we have a key field. And inside of here allows us to put in a key modifier for sorting by this column. So for example, if I wanted to sort by machine, I could put in say, you know, left shift plus F3 to sort by this column. In my case, I don't want to have anything, so I'm just going to cancel out. Then we have a unit column, which allows us to configure a unit of measurement for the, the column itself. So for example, 
uptime, we could put in here seconds. And it will display that as the unit of measurement for that column. And then finally, the number of decimal points. If we were dealing with real data types, we could enter in here a number. So for example, if I put in two, I would only show two decimal places versus the typical seven. I'll leave everything blank except for the labels and the types. And then down at the bottom, we have two checkboxes for options. Show ID column. This column here, we'll see something similar at runtime where each row will have its own number. And then allow sorting. So with this check, we'll be able to sort by the columns. If not, it is how we configure that in the uh, advanced settings for the grid object. I'm going to leave both checked. And then below that, we have two buttons here for moving rows up or down if I wanted to resort them. Additionally, I can cut and paste rows in. I can also delete rows by right clicking and selecting delete line and we'll delete it out. So with my columns configured, I will click okay. And then under advanced, this is where we can set up quite a bit of additional information, for example, metadata for the grid object itself. So the first field is user enable. And what this allows us to do, it allows us to configure the grid to either be a display only or allows us to interact with it, being able to sort, being able to resize the columns, being able to enter in data, things like that. However, if we set user enable to false, and the grid is locked out, we can't even scroll. We won't even be able to scroll below the number of rows. So if we have more rows loaded into the grid than we can display, we will not be able to scroll with user enable set to false. And for this, we are going to create a new tag called grid enable. And we are going to create it as a Boolean. And then below that is number of rows. And this is just a running tally that is compiled in real time of how many rows are currently displayed or loaded into the grid. Uh, whenever we reload or refresh the grid, this number is recompiled. And we're going to add in another tag here called grid num rows. And we are going to create this as an integer. The selected value fields allow you to configure an array tag. And whenever you select a row in the grid, the values of each column of that selected row are written into each position of the array tag that is configured here. Additionally, you can modify the values of that selected row by simply modifying the values of the corresponding cell. Also, you can configure the initial offset of the array when you configure a tag inside of this field. We're going to add a new tag here called grid SEL. And then inside of square brackets, we're going to put in an array element of zero. So we're actually going to start at the very first element of this array. And when we configure it, what we're going to do is we're going to make it an array with a value of five. And we are going to set these as a string. And we're doing that because even though we have two columns that are configured as numeric, we have one column that is configured as a string. So with Blue Open Studio, you can write numeric values into a string tag, but you can't write string values into a numeric tag. So the rule of thumb is if you're configuring a grid object and you are wanting to use this grid selection uh, option, if you have any of your columns configured as strings, whatever you set for your array tag, you want to make sure that the data type is a string. Below that we have a row number field. And whenever you select a row in the grid object, the number of that row that's currently selected is written into the tag that is configured here. Also, you can modify the value of this tag to select different rows as well. And we're going to add in a new tag called grid 
pro num. And then when we create it, we're going to create it as an integer. And then below that is a condition field. And with this, you are able to enter in an expression to filter the grid data. And only rows that match that expression will be displayed. Uh, the expression that you enter in here has to follow a very specific syntax. So for example, we would put in the column name like so. And then we have an operator and a value. So if we wanted to do it for our grid, we would put in machine equals machine A. However, we're going to leave this blank. If you want to know more about how you can configure the condition field, Please refer to the technical reference or help manual that comes with the software and look for the grid object. It gives a lot of good examples of what you can do inside of the condition field in order to properly filter out the information you need. Below that we have a print trigger field. And you configure a tag in here and whenever that tag is toggled, meaning it changes value, doesn't matter what it changes to or from, just as long as it changes value, the current state of the grid object is sent to the default printer. Now this is tied right into the PC or the system that the application is running on. So if you do not have a printer configured or a default printer selected, it just will not print anything. Additionally, you could set it to a PDF printer if you wish, but some of those usually require some additional configuration. Also right below the print trigger, we have a PDF trigger, which works the same way. The only difference is that when this tag toggles value, it will print the current state of the grid object and save it as a PDF file. And the location and name for that file are specified in the PDF file name field. This could be a static string of text, or you could put a tag in here and dynamically change the, the file name, the path, or both uh, at runtime. And then to the right, we have a checkbox for multi-line. When this is selected, the PDF output will be formatted according to the available column space. And within each cell, the text will be wrapped so that all of it is shown. So what will happen is with this unchecked, the current state of the grid is printed and the column width is, is locked. So when we print, we will only see however much text we can fit into the width that is selected at runtime. With this box checked, what will happen is it will then wrap the text around so it fits it all in, keeping the column width the same. So what will happen is the row height will increase to fit the text. The best example of this is if you're trying to print the grid in a portrait landscape and you have your columns set to the width to where it takes up just one page width, but you want to make sure you see all the text. What this will do is this will increase the height of the rows. It may increase the number of pages you print, but everything will still stay in a linear order where you won't have to put two pages together to get the full width of the columns. And then we have a reload field. When we configure this with a tag, Whenever that tag changes value, it will reload or refresh the grid. So we're going to put a new tag in here called grid refresh. And we are going to set that as an integer. And just as a side note, I use an integer because when I refresh, I simply increment the tags value by one. So I can keep track of how often or how many times the grid has been reloaded. Then below that we have a save trigger field. And when a tag is configured in this box, whenever the value of that tag changes, the data source, and it requires it to be either a text file or a database, uh, will be updated with the current value of the grid object. 
this field is not available when the data source is set as a class tag because the values are automatically updated because we're reading and writing directly from the tags. With data source or text file, we are essentially buffering the values in a temporary location. And then this allows us then to commit the changes back to the data source. The insert trigger field is a little more complicated. Uh, there is another option that is required for this, and that is this checkbox down here that says auto refresh after insert trigger. So when that box is checked, when the tag changes value in the insert trigger field, it will reload the database table and then reload the grid. And then a new row is added to the table and the values of the array that are configured in the inserted values box, which is to the right, are automatically inserted. And this inserted values is an array tag that is configured to allow you to enter in the values. To recap, if we put an array tag in the inserted values field and we enter values into those array elements, whenever the tag in that is configured in the insert trigger field is toggled, it will take the values that are in the inserted values array and place them in as a new row into the data source. And then down below are, are several checkboxes that we can configure. Uh, the one that is checked by default, which is important to know, is the save on data change. So what will happen is, with that box checked, if we can click on a field and modify the values, as soon as we click away from it, it commits those changes back to the source. It doesn't necessarily just hold them in this temporary memory location. It will commit them back to the data source. And that is checked by default. So if you don't want to do that, if you want to use the save trigger, you want to uncheck this box. And then the option to the right, enable slider or resize. This will allow us to resize the columns or have a slider on the uh, right-hand side to scroll up and down. The conditional checkbox option is a little confusing. What this allows you to do when enabled is it prevents a user from checking a checkbox in the grid at runtime unless all the preceding checkboxes in the same column are also checked. Usually, you know, this is used for when you want to oblige or require a user to follow a predefined sequence. This option is not available when the data source is set as a class tag because once again, we are writing or reading directly to or from the class tag values. And then below that, we have show header, which are the column names that we see across the top. So we can disable that and just simply show the values without the headers. Additionally, show grid lines, which will take out the grid lines. And then enable translation. When we enable this, this allows us to include the text that is displayed in the grid object to be part of the multi-language or translation option uh, at runtime. With it unchecked, we omit the values that are displayed in the grid. And then below, disable tab to navigate through cells. So right now we can use tab similar to Excel to tab through the cells row by row if we wanted to. And as I've already mentioned about the auto refresh after insert. And finally, the concatenate label for picture. With this selected, the reference name for the picture is the result of the concatenation of the name in the field column with the value of the label column. As a result, it will look like label name underscore field name. This is useful if you want to shorten the names or make them a little more concise when you view them. And then below is an export option. And what we have here is we have a field for a class array tag, which we can configure to store the information that is currently displayed in the grid. And then we have a trigger field. And with the trigger field, whenever the tag configured here changes value, it will then take the values that are in the grid and export them out to our class tag. And then finally, the auto format. 
this allows you to format the decimal values in the columns that are set as a numeric type to be formatted according to the virtual table created by a function called set decimal points. This option only works in columns for which decimal points are not already configured. So for example, if we put in for, for two of our columns to have a decimal places of zero, and we have four other columns that we didn't put those in for, those other four columns would use the auto format. Um, however, that only applies to columns that are set as a numeric that have decimal places. So if we're using whole numbers, for example, using an integer, we will not see decimal places. If they are real data types, then we will. So there's a couple of different steps that have to be met in order for this to actually be used. We have our five tags configured. I will click OK. And then finally, under fonts, this is similar to what we've seen in the past with other objects where we can configure our font our style, our size, the color, any effects, and this will apply to the entire grid. So every single line will have this font style. I'm going to leave it at default. And then finally, we have our colors. So we have options for the highlight color. So when we select a row, what color do we want it to see? Additionally, what color do we want the text to be when it's highlighted? And then finally, colors for odd and even lines. So we can alternate colors in the grid to make it a little easier to read. And we can pick what colors we want. I'm gonna leave everything here as default. And then below we have similar things we've seen to other objects. We have a disable field. So if this field is set to true, the grid will be disabled. It won't even reload, it won't even refresh. It will simply be a static grid with possibly stale data. And then we have our right to left reading option, e-signature, security, and virtual keyboard. So we have our grid configured here. So I'm going to kind of move it over a little bit. And you see that once we put in our columns, that it formatted it to view those columns with the labels. So I'm just going to resize it here to get us a little more space. And then I'm going to put down at the bottom a couple of more objects. We're going to put in a couple of buttons and a display. So I'm going to go to the Graphics tab, click on Button, and then draw my button, go in, and for the caption, I'm going to put in Grid, and then hit Enter, and now I'm going to use an If condition. And this If condition is going to be similar to what you see in Excel. It's going to be a single line, and it's going to be very basic. It might be a little complicated to read at first, but once you understand the format, it's pretty straightforward. So as always with caption fields, we have to put our function, in this case an if condition, inside of curly brackets. So inside of curly brackets, I type if, open parenthesis, grid, enable, equals zero, and that is my condition. So now I type a comma, and I'm gonna put what to display or what to do if the equation evaluates true. In this case, I want to display the word locked. And that will be inside of double quotes. And then another comma. So now we are going to put in the value. So now we're going to put in what we will display if the condition evaluates as false. And then inside of double quotes again, we'll type in unlocked. And then finally close parenthesis. And I know it's a little difficult to read. So let me zoom in. So as you see, if, and then inside of parentheses, we have our equation grid enable equals zero comma. And then what we want to do if the equation evaluates true, we want to display locked comma. And then what we want to do if the equation evaluates as false, which will be display the word unlocked. And then I will click on Command. And now on the Command animation, I will click on On Up. And then inside of here, I will do another If condition. Only this time, it will be to toggle the value for the Grid Enable tag. And we haven't talked much about scripting. 
and we will go more in depth in the scripting tutorial video. But a basic if condition in VB script, if, and then I will hit the dollar sign to bring up the autocomplete, and then grid enable equals zero, then grid enable equals one. And then else, grid enable equals zero, and then end if. So this is a basic if condition used inside of VB script. So we are once again having an equation with evaluating. And if the equation is true, in this case, if grid enable equals zero, then we're going to set it to one. Else, if it does not equal zero, we are going to set it to zero. And we can do it this way because we have grid enable configured as a Boolean data type. So it can have one of two values. It could have a value of zero or a value of one. If it was an integer and I wanted to make sure that I was doing it on specific values, instead of else, I would do else if, and then again, another grid enable equals one. And now what I'm doing is I'm checking for another specific condition if the first one wasn't met. But as I mentioned, we will cover that in the scripting tutorial video. So I have that configured. I will close and I'm going to resize this really quick because that's bothering me. Move that up. And then I will copy this button over to the other side. And in this button, for the on up, I will delete all of this and then we'll put in our refresh tag. So I'll, I will type the dollar sign to bring up the autocomplete and then grid refresh equals grid refresh plus one. And that's it. And then I will click on back to button to change the caption. And I will simply type in refresh grid. Now I'll put in a rectangle in the middle here to display a couple of different properties for the grid. So I will go to the caption and then I will type in number of rows and then inside of curly brackets I'll put in our number of rows tag which is grid num rows and then on the next line I will type in selected row and then inside of curly brackets grid row num And just to make it a little easier, I will make it the center left for alignment and click OK and back out. And now you see that we have our grid configured. So I will save this screen and then I will open my navigation screen and copy my widget button. And I will configure this new button to go to our grid screen. So I'll change the caption to grid and then go to my command and change the open function from widget to grid. And now I will save. I will close my screens and then I will start my runtime. And then once my runtime opens, I will snap it to the right, snap my grid to the left and I will go to grid. And you see here that we have three rows. And once again, if I go back into my training files, I bring up my grid, snap this to the left. We see that we have the values that are in the text file displayed in the grid. And I use Notepad++ because what it will do is it will allow multiple 
connections to the text file. Unlike Notepad, which monopolizes the text file uh, sometimes, Grid++ will allow us to keep it open here and also have it here. So for example, if I come in here, you see that I can't click on anything. And that's because the grid is locked. Once I click on this, now I'm able to select a row. And you see in the rectangle down here, we have the total number of rows and row, row I have selected. I can resize these if I want. I could sort by each column, ascending or descending order. And additionally, if I came in here, I could change this value And then I will have to refresh. And Notepad++ does a great job of monitoring when a file either no longer exists or when it's been updated. So once I click focus back onto it, it says that it's been modified. Do you want to reload it? I click yes. And now we see that we have the new value in there. In addition, the blank rows are now missing. And if I were to come in here and let's say change machine C, it's downtime from 66 to 100 and save. I get a lock error because I am accessing it somewhere else. If I were to close this, refresh, and the refresh allows us to simply reload. And you see quickly that the num number of rows quickly goes to zero and then back to the number because it's clearing it out and then reloading from the source. So we've seen how to display data from a text file into a grid. Let's look at how to display data from a class tag into the grid object. So I will go back into the development under my project explorer and I will open my grid screen. And what we will do is we will actually show two functions of the grid object. The first will be, as I mentioned, displaying data from a class tag, but the second will be showing how to export the data to a class tag. So we will actually set up this grid to export the data to a class tag. It will then be displayed in a second grid object. So what I will do first is go into my grid object and go under advanced and we have to configure our class tag and trigger for export. So in here, I will put in a new tag called grid class, and I have to put in the starting element that I wanna use. So I'll do the first one, which is zero, and it doesn't exist, so I wanna create it. Yes, set the array to five, leave the type as integer because we will create the class later and then reassign the tag. And then for trigger, we want to set this to export grid. And we will create this as a Boolean. So that configures the grid. Now all we need is a way to trigger that export. So what I will do is I will copy my refresh button and bring it up here and then go in to the button to command animation. Now we'll change the on up animation from VB script type to toggle tag. And in here I will type in my new tag export grid. And then we will now create the second grid that will display the class tag. I will copy my original grid and move it down here. And what I will do is I'll shrink it a little bit because I know I'm only going to have a total of three rows. And then I will go into the properties and change the data source from text file to class tag. And then click on data source settings. And you now see that the data source settings dialog is significantly different. We have three fields that we need to configure. The first is a class tag, which will be the tag name that we want to display. So in this case, we're going to enter in grid class. And if we wanted to set a, an array offset or a specific number to start, we would put it in here. So for example, if I wanted to start at array element three, which is the fourth element, I would 
set it like this, and then it would display three, four, and five. In our case, we don't, so I can leave it blank. And then we have the number of items, which will be the total number of rows to display in the grid. Uh, for us, we could enter in five, which will show a total of five items, even though we have six. If we wanted to show the max, we could put in six, but then if we ever change it in the future, we would have to come back here and modify this. But there's a way around it. There's a way to dynamically set what to use, like how to read in the maximum arrays. And that is a tag property. So I will type in the tag grid class and then a dash and a greater than sign. And now I will use the tag property size. And what this does is at runtime, when the application first starts, it reads in the total number of array elements for the tag. And then it sets that for its size. So now, even six months down the road, let's say that we change it from five to three or change it to 50. We don't have to worry about coming back in here and changing that number manually because it will automatically read that in when the application starts. And then finally, we have a view field. And in this field, when the tag changes value, it will bring up a dialog that will allow us to show or hide specific columns or members from the class and also reorder how they are laid out in the grid at runtime. So we can dynamically set how the grid looks when using a class tag. For us, we will leave it blank. And then if we go into columns, we see that we have a new field called member. And this field will correspond to the member names for the tag. Uh, if we leave it blank, it will use whatever labels we have configured. So in this case, machine, uptime, and downtime. Uh, for us though, what we're going to do is we're going to copy and paste those in, and then we're going to change the labels. Uh, so we're going to change machine to include name, and then uptime we'll put a space in between the two words, and downtime will do the same thing. And we'll leave everything else the same. So we click OK, and now that's set. The last thing we need to do is clear out some of the settings that were used for the first grid. So we go into advanced. We want to clear out the grid enable, and let's just say we want to view only. So we'll set that to zero. And then we'll clear out the number of rows, the selected values, and the row number. Because we don't want this grid stepping on the properties of the first grid. Also, we'll clear out the export fields as well. And finally, for the reload, we want to make sure we can refresh the values for this grid. So we will just create a new tag called grid refresh 2. And we'll set that as an integer as well. Once we have that configured, we will close this out. And the grid is all set. The only thing left is the refresh button. So I will copy the first refresh and bring it down here. And then I will simply change the script to be the new tag grid refresh to. And now we just have to create the class and assign the tag to be that class. So I will go to my global tab in the project explorer, right click on classes, select insert class, and give it a name of grid. And now for the members, I will type in machine, uptime, and downtime. And change the data type for machine to string, and leave the other two as integers. Now the class is uh, created. I will close this, and then under the Project Explorer again, bring up the data sheet view for the project tags. Scroll all the way to the bottom, and make sure that my grid class changes from an integer to my grid type. And we see that we have the array set to five. The type is grid. So now I will close both the tag list and my grid screen, saving it as I do. And then I will start my runtime. Snap the runtime to the right. 
the development to the left and go to my grid screen. And you see that the second grid already has rows in it. And that's because it's reading in from the class tag. And it's showing, even though there's no values there, that it sees that there are multiple array elements for that tag. You see that we show one through five, however, we have six. So if I were to come back in here to my graphics tab and bring up my grid screen, let's move this down. Let's stretch this out a little bit to show a sixth row. Make sure everything's laid out nice and I save. We see that we show nothing here. And that's because that first array element, that zero, is omitted. So now if I export my grid, which I forgot to change the text, so I will quickly come back in here, change that to export, double check my command, and I will save again, and now I'll export. You see that the new values now automatically get loaded in. So let's say that we didn't want to see these blank rows. Well, there's a way to filter those out by using that condition field. If I go back into my development and I go to the second grid and I go to advanced and this condition. So now we have to put in, as I stated earlier, the column name, operator, and then value. So in this case, inside of square brackets, I want to put in machine name. And yes, we're talking about the column label, not the member name in this case. And then I'll put in does not equal and then blank. So essentially what we're looking for here is any rows or any array elements that the machine member is not blank. If I click OK and then I save, see now that the two empty rows are hidden. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact ProFace America Technical Support by phone at 1-800-289-9266, option 2, or by email support at profaceamerica.com. You can also visit our website, profaceamerica.com, for drivers, manuals, FAQs, and other product and software information. Thanks again, and have a great day.